Take your, take your Bibles tonight and turn to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. You have a Bible tonight, say amen. Um, we should know better than to trust the mind of man or the teaching or the instruction of man when it comes to wanting to know things of the future. How many of you just, I, I mean, I'm not saying you're just totally devoted to it, but you like to hear teaching about the end times, about prophecy, about things that are going to happen. There is a common interest in that, and a lot of that has gone by the wayside in, in uh, a lot of church teaching. They just don't deal with it. They don't talk about it. Uh, it's not something that people uh, just really get excited about anymore. And that itself may be a sign of the times. I don't know. I just know that uh, several years ago, I've, I've always had an interest in prophecy. I've always had an interest in, in wanting to know things uh, that are going to happen in the last days. And I'll be honest with you, uh, in the sight of all men here tonight, that I do not claim in any way to be a, a prophetic expert. I don't think that anybody really could be. There's some guys out there that are writing a lot of books. They have a lot of TV programs. They have a lot of radio programs. And we would call them the prophetic experts. But the truth of it is, we see through a glass darkly. And that is all of us. All of the preachers, all of the teachers, all the ministers, all of the theologians, we are seeing through a glass darkly when it comes to trying to look into the future. And... Um, and I remember back several years ago when God called me sort of, I guess, officially into a ministry of studying Bible prophecy, is that one of the things that I did, one of the things that I really felt God was leading me to do, was to really just throw out everything that I'd ever learned. I, I would be, uh, I, if you wanted to label me with the labels that are out there, whether you are post-millennial, amillennial, or what they would call pre-millennial, which means you believe in a millennial reign of Christ, a thousand years, and I do, I literally believe that Christ is going to reign on this earth for a thousand years. I believe it because the Bible says it and there's no way around it. Uh, but categorically, um, at this time you could have categorized me as what was called a pre-tribulational, pre-millennial um, eschatologist, I guess. Pre-tribulational meaning that I had a firm belief that the rapture was going to occur prior to what a lot of people call the tribulation, which they say lasts seven years, and then uh, at the end of that, Christ returns and sets up his kingdom, which is premillennial. He sets it up before the millennium, and uh, or the rapture occurs before the millennium, and Christ reigns a thousand years, and then there is a, another a sort of chaos event on the earth, and then it's all said and done with, and you have the final judgment, and everybody's either in the lake of fire or they're in heaven. There, I've, I mean, even meeting a lot of people in my travels that uh, they say, Brother Mike, I don't believe in a rapture anymore. I've heard that, I've heard that, I've heard that. And they say, you'll not find the word rapture in the Bible, and that's true, and I'll probably deal with that in this series. Um, they say, you don't find it in the Bible, and uh, I don't believe it anymore. Um, and uh, I, I don't know where they get that. I do know that one of the even even one of the things when I ask God to show me from scratch, to start from scratch in my mind, what is going to happen? Uh, I even just threw out the rapture. I threw it all out, and I said, "Now, God, if there's going to be a rapture, you show it to me." And so I was reading the Bible, reading the verse Jeremiah 33:3, 3, "Call unto me, and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not." One of the things that I knew is that, that if I went to God while God's trying to teach me, if I went to God and said, God, I already know this, let's move on, God can't teach you anything. Okay? It's like if you're in a work environment and you're trying to train somebody. Bradley, in, in, in your work environment, you hire in lots of new young people. Okay? Young people who think they're smarter than anybody else that's ever worked that job before. He works at McDonald's, by the way. So these kids show up, and they think they've already got it figured out how everything goes. Have you ever encountered people like that? You can't teach them anything because they already know. They already know everything, and so you can forget about that. By the way, these become one of some of the worst workers that you ever have work for you in the environment. Amen? You can't teach them anything. They're so smart. They're smarter than you, and you've been doing the job for years. And uh, so I decided not to go with God and say, God, I've already, uh, I've already got my rapture figured out, so let's move on from there. I threw it out. And I said, God, is there going to be a rapture? Is there going to be an event 
in this world where a generation or a group of people, your people, leave this earth and go to heaven without dying? Is this going to take place? So I ask the question, and God could have just said yes, or he could have said no. Instead, God began to take me on a journey through the scriptures of understanding Bible prophecy from one source and one source only. And that source was not Jack Van Impey. It was not Tim LaHaye and Left Behind series. It was not Grant Jeffries. It was not Noah Hutchings. It was not Stan Johnson. It was not any of these guys. And I'm not, I'm not knocking them or, or one way or the other. I'm just saying what I had to learn was not going to come from them. What I had to learn was going to come from the pages of this King James Bible right here. This is the more sure word of prophecy. Do you believe that? Say amen. It is the more sure word of prophecy. And so what we're going to learn, we're going to learn from this book and from this book alone. You're there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Say amen. Look at verse 13. The Bible says, but I would not have you to be ignorant. Here it is again. We're, we're preaching out of 2 Peter chapter 3, and there Peter is saying, everybody else is ignorant. You don't be ignorant. Their world is ignorant of one thing. And that is, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. And by the way, I'm going to reference that later on. But the world is ignorant of that, and they have forgotten God's time frame for prophecy. They have forgotten all about that, and they're willfully ignorant of it. But God tells us, I don't want you to be ignorant of this thing. And sadly, there are too many church members out there that are totally ignorant of what will be the greatest thing to ever happen to the church in church history. Amen? The greatest single event to ever happen is the translation of the church into heaven without death. That's what I call a miracle. Amen? But most people are ignorant about it. They say, if you ask them, do you believe in a rapture? Oh yeah, I believe in a rapture. Do you, what do you know about it? They couldn't tell you. They've probably heard it talked about from a pulpit. They may have read a couple of the Left Behind books. They think that they have this and that and the other, or they don't know anything whatsoever. But the truth of it is, they're willfully ignorant of something like this, as if it doesn't have any kind of application in their life whatsoever. And I would just ask you simply this. As a Christian, as a born-again Christian, struggling the way you struggle, tr enduring the way you're enduring, going through the hardships of life, doesn't it, did, do you not ever sit down uh, sometimes at the end of a long, hard day where it just seemed like the devil has walked all over you and said, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Have you not ever done that? Amen? Lord, you could bring this on today as far as I'm concerned. I tell you, I've been in situations since I've been pastor that I've been through that I said, you know what? The only thing, the only thing that could ever bail me out of a situation that I'm in is that the Lord just start doing his deal right here and right now. I found out that I was wrong. I found out that God can do a lot more things than that. Amen? It's not over yet just because you had a bad day. But we long for, and we're in fact, we're groaning. We're groaning. If we're going to live for God, we're going to groan and yearn for the day when Christ appears in the clouds. We should look forward to it. We should pray for it. We should live like it's going to happen this evening. Amen? Wouldn't it be a shame for the Lord to come on Sunday evening and you watch an NFL football. Amen? Wouldn't it be a shame? So anyway, this event is going to happen. And Paul said, I would not have you to be ignorant concerning them which are asleep. Now the word asleep in the Bible always refers to who? Dead people. Okay? It refers to those, or, or I won't say always, but I'm saying it's a way that the Bible refers to dead people. Remember what Jesus said about Lazarus when they were seen sitting there with his disciples. And they were questioning him, Lord, why don't we go and heal Lazarus now? And he said, Lazarus sleepeth. And they said, well, yeah, he's resting because he's sick. And he said, no, you don't understand. Lazarus is dead. The Bible will explain its own language. He said, concerning them which are asleep, in other words, concerning those which are dead... 
He said, don't be ignorant that ye sorrow not, even as others which have what? No hope. The Bible calls the rapture, the translation of the church, it calls it our blessed hope and glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I don't have hope in this world. I don't have hope in elections. I don't have hope in men or finances or anything else. But my hope and my blessed hope is that one of these days I'm going to lift up my head and my redemption is going to draw an eye. I am going to see Jesus in the clouds. And he said, like others who have no hope, those that are asleep in the grave, those Christians... And see, you have to understand that it, it looks like that here Paul is addressing a people who believed that Christ was coming in their day, just like we do now. And some of those church members had already died. And, Paul, and they probably said, oh no, they died before the Lord came. Paul said, I don't want you to be ignorant. I'm going to show you something. Actually, what Paul's going to show them, and we'll see that here in a minute, what Paul's going to show them is that because they died, they get to go first. Amen? So if you want to be first in the rapture, die. Okay? Amen? If you want to be first when the Lord appears in the clouds, if you want to be the first one there, all you got to do is die. All right? I'm not offering that as uh, something I think you should do. All right? Because we are being taped on this thing, all right? Uh, verse, uh, they'll start accusing us of being Jim Jones and passing out Kool-Aid and all that stuff. Uh, verse 14, for if, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Do you believe that Jesus died? Say amen. Do you believe that he rose again? Say amen. If you believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. He's offering us hope. We're the ones, and I've said this over and over, we're the ones who when we look at a casket up in front of a funeral parlor or in, funeral, in front of a church, we're the ones who are supposed to see that and say, I've got hope that this is not over yet. That body is coming up out of that grave. That body is going to live again. So it says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Verse 15, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. In other words, this is an absolute, steadfast, sure thing. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. In other words, we're not going to go before them and we're not going to keep them from going. So now here I want you to look at this. And this is absolutely, this is thus saith the Lord. The appearing of Jesus Christ in the clouds of glory. And if you look through Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13, Revelation chapter 1 I think you will see that Jesus gave a sign to be watched for. And that sign was, ye shall see the Son of Man coming, how? In the clouds. In the clouds. Now you might want to remember that because I, I'm pretty sure that as part of this study, we're going to examine those clouds. Okay? Because I think, and I, this is just a theory, this is not thus saith the Lord yet, but I think that the world is going to be, in fact I do know this for sure, the world is going to be offered a false Christ. Right? The world is going to be offered a false Christ. And you know what I think? I think that when the world is offered this false Christ, there will be something about clouds that will be absent from him. I think that Christ is trying to get us to recognize that the true Christ, the real Jesus, when he comes, he will come, how? In the clouds. And I don't have, like I say, I don't have all that sorted out yet. I don't know everything. But I think that the world is going to accept a false Jesus who comes to this earth 
and he comes without clouds and they're going to accept him. You know why? They're ignorant of what's written here. They're going to fall for the wrong thing. So what we're looking at here, when Christ appears in the clouds, he is going to call up two groups of people. Number one, those who have already died and were born again when they lived on this earth. Those who have already died and who are born again when they lived on this earth. They first will come up. Okay? Number two, all of those Christians who are alive and remain, and I'm going to take you someplace else here and we'll see that. All of those Christians who are alive at the time that this happens are going to leave this earth literally without ever dying. Okay? We're going to see it here, but first I want to take you backwards just for a second, and I want us to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, a man came to me several years ago, good friend. I know him to be a good godly man. He's full of the love of the Lord and he believes the Bible. Uh, he gave me a theory one time that uh, I, I admit I, I, I never really thought of it. But he, he felt like that at the time of the Lord's appearing that all the Christians would die. And I disagree with that biblically. I don't think that that's true. I think the Bible's telling us something here. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Now let's back up to verse 50 so you can get a context here. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50. The Bible says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Let me, let me just throw something in here for right now. There's a group, I mentioned this at the beginning, there's a group of people called amillennialist. Okay? And that's basically two words. A means no way, and millennial means a thousand years. So literally, they're saying no way is there going to be a thousand year reign. They look at the Bible and they say the thousand year reign is not exactly a thousand years. It is symbolic of Christ reigning in the hearts of men during the church age, which is right now. They say that we are already in the millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ. Now, I have some just outward problems with that. In that number one, I don't like this world right now. And if Jesus is in charge of the whole world, I think he's doing a lousy job. Amen? And I'm not trying to knock our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'm just telling you that there still is a God of this world that is not in any way bound up the way they say he is. This is not the millennium. It's not. The devil is destroying too many Christian homes and too many churches and too many families and too many lives and too many nations. He's doing and his power is getting stronger. It's not diminishing. This is not the millennium. They say that the kingdom of God already is. And yet, if that's true, this verse says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. That means that right now we cannot be in the kingdom of God because you and I are still flesh and blood. Amen? So he says, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption, which is our body, inherit incorruption. Now this next verse here, we have this printed on a, on a piece of paper in our nursery downstairs. It says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Some of y'all get that and some of you don't. That sign over a nursery, get it? We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Alright. Look at that verse again. Behold, I show you a mystery. By the way, I love this. I did a study on the word mystery. The word mystery is mentioned 22 times in the King James Bible. You know what the number 22 represents? Revelation. The book of Revelation has 22 chapters in it, and you can see it all through the scriptures. The number 22 actually basically means things that are revealed. But here we have the word mystery 22 times, and it's all in the New Testament. You know what I found out? That every time you see the word mystery in your King James, the mystery is revealed. He's showing you. Look at what he says here. Behold, I show you a what? 
He's not saying, oh, there's a mystery about this, and oh, I know it, but I can't tell you because you're not worthy. That's garbage. That's mystery religion. Amen? Paul said, Jesus showed me this. I'm going to show it to you. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Remember what sleep means. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Meaning, number one, that group that dies before Christ returns, when they come up out of the grave. By the way, let me clear this up for you. The same body that we put in the grave is not the same body that's coming out of that grave. If it did, we would look like Michael Jackson's thriller video. Or Night of the Living Dead. Maggots hanging off of us and walking around. That's not, that's not how it is. What about those brave Christians who have been burnt literally to nothing at a, at a stake of persecution? Can't be the same body, is it? In fact, this body turns back into dust, doesn't it? In 1 Corinthians 15, you know what the whole point of 1 Corinthians 15 is? It's to show you that the body of our resurrection is not the same body we put in the ground. And Paul said, let me show you this by showing you what a seed. You take a seed, a kernel of corn, and it, we know what a kernel of corn looks like, right? Guess what you bite into when you try to drink the popcorn? The kernel of corn, you place that in the ground. What comes up out of the ground doesn't look like what you put in the ground, does it? And he says, if you, this is a wonderful chapter on the resurrection. If you look at that, it basically tells you, we, put, we plant people. We don't bury them, we're planting them. Why? Because we believe in a resurrection. They're going to be given a brand new body. Aren't you glad? You're not getting this one back? Okay? No health insurance premiums in heaven. Amen? None of them. So anyway, he says, number one, the, the bodies, the dead bodies, new bodies going to be given to them. And then he said, we which are alive and remain, we're all going to be changed. Verse 52, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trump shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed changed, transformed. We're going to see a place in the Bible later on where the Bible uses the word translated. Okay? Referring to Enoch. We shall be changed instantaneously, guys. When the trumpet sounds and the shout goes forth, you and I, and it says in the twinkling of an eye. In the twinkling of an eye. Now, I don't know about you, but it doesn't say blink of an eye. Now, a blink is still pretty fast, right? Okay, now you could just blink real good. And everybody, when I say blink, everybody's going. It's just like if I were to say yawn. and <sighs> About four or five of us. Oh, my goodness. In the twinkling of an eye, light dancing off the wet areas of the of the outer part of our eye, just boom, just like that. As fast as light itself, this event takes place. Okay? It would be different for those who are waiting till the last breath of life to get things right with God. If I walked up to them or somebody did with a pistol, put it up to their head and said, you're going to die in five, four, three, I'd be praying. Amen? I would be praying. They won't even get that chance. In the twinkling of an eye, faster than a thought process, we're gone. And we are instantaneously transformed, changed into a new body. So, we have the dead in Christ, and we have those which are alive. Now, Take your Bibles, turn back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Verse 16. Here he, here he spells it out. Okay? And we look for witnesses in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 15 is one witness. 
witness. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is the second witness, teaching you the same doctrine. Verse 16, for the Lord himself, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the where? Because that's where Jesus is. Remember? He is in the clouds. We shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And by the way, He's in the air, which means He's not yet come down to the earth. This is not Revelation 19. Revelation 19, in fact, let's, let's do this real quick because there's something interesting here I want to show you. There are those who say that they believe in a rapture, but it takes place at the end of, of, of what we'll call the seven years. It takes place at the end of the seven years when Christ comes down to the earth. Okay, now remember. Jesus told us, he said, Behold, I come in the clouds. I shall appear in the clouds. He shall be in the clouds, in the clouds, in the clouds. Here in 1 Thessalonians, we are going to meet the Lord in the clouds, right? Now look at Revelation chapter 19. This is the second coming of Christ. This is him literally coming down to the earth to establish the, the kingdom. Look in verse 11. And I saw heaven open. What is the barrier between earth and heaven? The clouds. And at this point, heaven is open, which means there are no clouds. None. So he says, I saw heaven open. Behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. This is talking about the second coming of Christ when he literally comes down to the earth. Uh, I believe Zechariah says at the Mount of Olives, he literally establishes, he puts his feet down there and establishes his kingdom on this earth, not in the air somewhere. So the, what we call the rapture is separate is a separate event from what we see here in Revelation 19. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay? Does everybody see what I'm seeing here in verse 11? If the heavens open, that means there are no clouds there. And so that's not where we're going to be raptured at. Okay? Now, let's go back to this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And here it is, I like it. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of preach this to you a little bit. Okay? I think... As a born-again, Bible-believing Christian, it should be our earnest, heartfelt desire, the desire of all ages, to be with God. Can I hear you say amen? I don't know about you. I'm gonna, I, I, you know me, I like to reveal sort of personal things about myself because I think that other people experience them. And I'm one of these guys that when I get alone and I'm praying in the Lord and I'm talking to my God, I often wish that I could actually see Him sitting next to me or in front of me face to face. Is anybody else like that but me? I see a lot of heads nodding. Okay? I actually long for the embrace of my Lord and my Savior. The same way that one would long, oh, and actually probably much deeper than 
one would long for the embrace of their spouse or the embrace of a child or the embrace of a parent or an old friend. It's much deeper than that. I'm not one of these guys that tries to talk up the intimacy that we're supposed to have with God. I think some of that's going way overboard. It's sort of like making God a boyfriend here. And I don't think that's right. But I do believe it should be our desire when we're alone. To want to be with Jesus. I want to be. I want to be with him. More than I want anything in this world. I want to be with Jesus. And God promises us. A promise. Promises with God are never broken. And this promise is that one of these days Christ is going to appear in the clouds to do one thing. And that is to bring us to Him so that from that point forward we will never be away from Jesus. Somebody say amen. Never, never, ever will we ever feel like we're all alone. That's what I want. Amen? That's what I want more than anything in this life. And he says in verse 18, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, I heard this, heard this preached and I like this. To put things in perspective for you, I want you to listen to this. Okay? How many of you believe hell is forever? Say amen. It's forever. You're not getting out. You won't be annihilated. One of the things, if I wanted to be a religion, I would be a Jehovah's Witness. Job's witness say that if you're wicked and you die, that's it. That's it. You're in the grave for all of eternity. And you have no knowledge of anything whatsoever. And I'm going, hey, that's pretty cool. I can live like a dog. And when I die, it's over with. I, I don't see how you promise people eternal life like that. I'd rather have eternal death. If that was the case. That's just how lazy I am. You promise me I can sleep forever? Pfft, yeah! Let's do it! What if, what if we believed that hell wasn't forever? That hell was a hundred years? You would die and you would go to hell for a hundred years. Now hell's hot. Excruciating pain for one hundred years. But at the end of that hundred years, Jody, you would be let out and enjoy eternal life in heaven forever. Well, it, let, me, let, me just, let me just give it to you like this. Let's say that we all had to do that in order to get to heaven. Okay? I mean, if I asked you right now, do you want to go to hell for all of eternity? You'd say, no. If I were to ask you to say, what if it's only for a hundred years? And then you would enjoy all the blessings of eternal life forever and ever in, in absolute eternal bliss for all of eternity. It might handle the hundred years. Right? at least you would be getting out and had something to look forward to. Hope. Well, let me give it to you like this then. 
we don't have to go to hell to get to heaven but we do have to live here to get there and I'll be honest with you I've been through some rough stuff in my life I know some of you you have too this is not as bad as hell and I'm thankful for that but I'm glad that I have something better to look forward to. And I don't think I ought to complain as much as I do about what I do have to live with. Because God has promised me a much greater thing. I am going to get to live with Jesus and never be separated from Him for all of eternity. I am going to get to get that and what did I do to deserve it? Nothing. I just believe that it's going to happen. Amen? And I believe in Jesus' saving grace. How many of you are excited about the rapture? Say amen. Could it happen tonight as far as you're concerned? What about what you got planned tomorrow? Huh? You forget it? I thought you were going to pump, pump iron this week. I thought you were going to work out, man. Who would get your truck? Paul. <laughs> Paul would? Yeah. Yeah. Let's hope not. Let's hope Paul wouldn't get his truck. Amen, Paul? Yeah. I tell you what, I, I, I've, I don't have any unbreakable plans when it comes to going to heaven. Amen? I don't have any unbreakable plans. I, and to be honest with you, one of the things that God is desperately trying to do in His church is to start getting us to cut ties with this world. So that, remember that rope I used this morning? Tied to the Word of God? I think in doing that, we're going to have to cut ties with the world because we'll be pulled apart, won't we? The Bible's going one way, the world's going to another. We're going to have to start cutting the strings of this world, cutting the connections off, and start having your days filled with breakable plans just in case God decides to blow a trumpet. Amen? Just in case He does. Now this is one of the teachings that I'm going to do on this. Okay, The rest of them I think are going to be a little bit more technical. We're going to go through the scriptures. We're going to see. I, I've got notes written here that I didn't get to about, about shouting. It says, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. You ought to see from the Bible what that's associated with. What's going to happen when that happens. You'll see it all through the Old Testament. You'll see it in the New Testament. Okay? And we'll actually look, we'll actually look at the testimony of people who were raptured. Okay? We're going to see their testimony. It's good to be with you tonight. Say amen. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, I thank you, God. Lord, Father, for giving us this promise.